Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back. I am so excited about my interview today. I don't even know where to start with these accomplishments. We are talking over 100 books written and published, which is an amazing feat on its own. Over 2 million books sold, which is crazy awesome. We have been on the list, the USA Today's bestselling list, nine times, featured in today's Happily Ever After and Pop Sugar. And I just want to finish it off with a little quote that I absolutely love by Kirkus Reviews, a sexy tale for modern women that's as steamy as a locker room shower. We have the one and only Renee Rose. How are you today? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so excited to have you on because we had a couple of weeks ago your partner in crime, I want to say, we had Lee Savino on and I absolutely adored her and I knew I would love you just as much dare I say, maybe even more, don't tell her that, but I just, you've both accomplished so much and you on your own, your accomplishments, numerous awards. It's just, it's so exciting to have you on. So I want to go straight to the start. Where and when did you start writing? Why? So I did, I got my degree in creative writing, but of course, like all college programs, they were very poo-poo about genre fiction. So like, you know, where I had like a professor who was like, you know, don't give it to me, I won't read it. You know, like that's like, we only write literary fiction here. So consequently, I was kind of highbrow and I didn't read, like I'd read romance, I guess, as a kid, like whatever teen romance was. Um, I can't even remember what those were, but Sweet Valley High or whatever. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I didn't read romance because like, I guess I thought I was too good for it. And so um, flash forward, you know, I was working as a technical writer for an engineering firm, which was like as boring as you can imagine. And um, and I was dancing and I had flown out to um, Connecticut to visit a friend of mine and she was a dancer and also like someone I considered like very smart and intellectual. And I was like, hey, and this is before Kindle. So I was like, hey, I need to borrow a book for the flight. You know, that was where we'd like, you just traded paperbacks back in the day. And um, she was like, oh, here, try this. And it was a Jenny Cruzy novel. Have you ever read her? No. Oh my God, I love her, <laughs> like, she's the best ever. So she was like pretty rom-com, like funny. Um, so she, and I was like, like I look at it and I'm like, you read romance? <laughs> like I had that like, is that okay? Like, she's like, just try it, you like it. And she was right. Like I was like, this is the best ever. Um, and part of it is like, I'm one of those law attraction people who's like, you know, you want to think good thoughts. So like romance is always happily ever after, right? Like you're, it's not literary fiction where it's like life sucks but you learn something, right? Which is just kind of a downer. <laughs> um, and then I, of course, I love sexy times. And yeah, I just loved everything about it. And I was like, I could do this. So that's that's how I got started. And then it was like right at the right time, you know, because like eBooks were just taking off and they had already taken off, but you know, I got in kind of early 2012. I love that so much. How did you, so you decided to write your first book. What year was this that you started writing the book? When did you publish and how did you find the indie publishing experience initially? So actually, so yeah, I think I spent like a year writing something that never got published. It was like a medieval romance that, I don't know, it's somewhere on some computer. I should pull it up at some point and see if anything be salvaged. But then it was another, again, it was a dancer in my, um, one of my classes was like, have you heard of this Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> I was like, tell me more. <laughs> And then I was like, oh my God, kink is my thing. Like I was, and so I sat down, I wrote that you're not going to believe the story because it's like so silly, but like I sat down and wrote like a novella in six days and I sent it off to um, like a small kinky press um, and they had just hired a new editor. So like my was, mine was the first book on his desk. And so he was like, we'll take it like two weeks later, it was published. Like it was crazy, like just crazy luck, right? And then my first check was like $4,500. So like for me, I was like the angels spoke and they want me to write sexy, kinky romance. <laughs> like, That's amazing. <laughs> that is such good fortune to have too, wow. Yeah, and then of course, you know, nothing was that easy after, but I felt like it was a sign, you know, like after that, like I was, cause then I was so sure, oh, every book's gonna do that well and you know, just, that was just like super lucky, but I felt like it was like a sign that I was like, you know, it threw me into this and, and was like an affirmation, like go for it, you know? Amazing. And you, at the time, we were talking a little bit before um, this interview started, but you actually had your own dance studio as well, because you're a professional dancer, which I find equally as amazing. So when did you 
do the switch to full-time writer? How long did that take you? So maybe like two years after I started writing, I stopped performing and then I was still teaching and, um, and I, I was seeing clients, I do a somatic a Feldenkrais method, which is a somatic where you like work with a movement education for people's better alignment. And I still do that, but I was doing that like more like I was seeing clients in my home. And so then I would like write on that, you know, just I was like one of those right in the in-between times. Like I would just take the little laptop with me at the kids swim lesson at the, you know, just like just write anywhere I could. Um, and I don't know, like it, I think I don't think I started prioritizing writing until a few years ago. Amazing. Like where I was like, no, this is my job, you know. Was that similar? Is that similar to uh, Reiki? Because you, you work. I do Reiki as well. Oh, amazing. Yeah. But no, it is more, um, it's like nervous system and bones. It's like, um, so, but it's very gentle movement to reorganize the, like um, the structure. You like the jack of all trades. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes it's like too many things to tell people. I'm like, it's a bunch of weird things, you know. <laughs> That's amazing though. You're just like, it's awesome. You've written over a hundred books. What is your process like? How do you continue to publish so many books every year and not burn yourself out? I, I don't write super long. So that part of that 100, you know, if you're someone who writes 90,000 word books and the higher, like I'm not one of you. So don't feel like, don't compare. Like, and especially when I started, I was writing more like 35,000 to 45,000. Um, and now I'm trying to do like 50 to 60. And I would love to push it up. I recently like was rereading an old book of mine and I was like this is so good and it was over too fast like I, I could see you know like I think I would like to push it a little longer but then I always balance that with like more books maybe is better than more than longer you know like the the economy of that right but I mean sometimes you have a story to tell I'm just I don't tend to be like the the longest storyteller that's good though, because you've obviously found your your spot. Like this is what you're comfortable with doing and executing and it works for you. You're, you're very successful. It works for you, which is awesome. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's true. Amazing. When was the moment that you realized, like I'm curious as to whether you had very quick momentum from the start of publishing or whether it did take a little bit of time and groundwork and what was the particular moment where you thought, wow, I'm actually, I'm a full-time author now. This is, this is it. I had, there was definitely like lots of frustrating, there was like lots of plateaus. Um, And so, like I said, I had that like really lucky beginning, but then it was not great after that. And then, um, and then it was like chugging along. Like my first couple of years, I maybe made like $40,000 a year. I was like, you know, it was like enough, like that would pay your mortgage. Like you could live on that. But, um, but it was like very, like, it wasn't growing. It was just kind of like steady. And then I, you know, I tried the like rapid release thing and I tried, and it was okay. So I went indie. That was like, all these things happened at once. So I went indie and I tried the rapid release. So I released, it was like book one in Zandian Masters, which is my science fiction series. And it had been previously in a like five book anthology. So I was like re-releasing it, but on my own. And then I had the second book ready because I, because that one had, had already been out. And so I did it like three weeks later. And that was my first five figure month. And I was like, oh my God, like this, this really works. And so that year I went, like I five X to my income. Like it was um, like, I hit the KU thing and I, I learned the like rapid release strategy with KU and, you know, I would price it like two ninety nine and then bump it to four ninety nine and just try to get in that, like where you hit low on rank to, um, to get shown in the store basically. Um, so that, I think that was, you know, just, seeing that much money come in like to five extra income all at once is just so exciting. Right. And that's when I was like, this is what I do. Like (laughs) I write kinky (laughs) sci-fi. That's so awesome. Who are some of the authors uh, that inspire you that you love to read? I am a diehard Tessa Bailey and LJ Shen fan, like just freaking like, you know, if they wrote a cookbook, I would buy it. Like just I'll read anything. I also really like, um, M. O'Keefe, Molly O'Keefe, but I like the, the M. O'Keefe, I think are the doctor, doc, darker ones. Um, so yeah, I like dark. I like dark romance. I like kink, like hot romance, I guess. Amazing. And how do you go writing that? Is a majority of it, um, it just, it comes to you, there's your inspiration, or do you have to do research on particular things? I don't research that much. I mean, you know, usually if it's just 
like I might have a scenario I don't know about like a I don't know like I had I have a book where he was out on parole and so like my friend's husband is a parole officer so I called him just to ask some questions but like usually that was a mafia one but you know usually I don't like like I don't go like interview the mafia or anything like that I just I just make it up <laughs> are you a plotter or a painter I am more and more of a plotter I I used to be more just like I would have some scenes in my head and I would just go from that but now I'm really trying like I try to follow the story beats I yeah I guess I'm not that much of a plotter but like when I get stuck I would like go back to that and try to figure it out from there can you explain to us a little bit about story beats and what they are? I would love to. I love story beats. Like, because to me, it was like, like after I discovered them, people were like, this book is really good. Like, because there's like, I think it's that we have that innate reaction. We're so used to like stories being told on that arc that it feels right when people read them. And when, and then it feels off when you don't follow them. Yeah. And so like, you know, it becomes formulaic, but I don't think anyone minds because it's like what you were so used to. So it's like for, I have, I have follow the, um, I don't want to say her name wrong, the Romancing the Beat book. You know me, like on the spot, I forget names. The beginning, of course, there's the meet cute, right? And then they both have their like, their reason why it can't happen. So they both have their like no go because of this. And then there's like the um, adhesion, which is like whatever it is that like is going to glue them together. Like they, you know, they get stuck in the cabin together or they have to work on this work project together or often because I write non-con, like often he kidnaps her and now they're stuck together because she's kidnapped. So that's, so that's the adhesion. And then we have like, as that develops, like you're growing toward the like growing trust, but still seeds of doubt, like sprinkled in there that like advance you know, withdraw sort of stage to the um, false high where it like looks like they're going to be together. Everything's going to work out. Things are happy. And then the black moment where like the bottom falls out and um, they both think that, you know, it's over. And then they each have the dark night of the soul where they like realize how bad they screwed up and that they, sh you know, it's like the movie montage you know, where they show all the scenes that were so good and you're like with the sad music and they remember how great it was and what, you know, why they wanted to hang on to that. And then the like grand gesture, which could be, which could come from either of them. I don't know, for some reason lately in my Chicago prophet, it's been coming from the heroine. I think traditionally it comes from the hero, like where he goes to fix things. I don't know if that's true or not, but like I've been having, cause, cause because it's like sh she's abducted and then it's like, I've been having like where, you know, she, she leaves and then comes back. So like, she's the one who's making the grand gesture. I don't know, I'm mixing it up, I guess. But someone makes a grand gesture and then they're, and then the happily ever after. Speaking of that series, you just had The Soldier recently released, the fourth Yes. Series. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, that one was different because they had already met at, um, I did a short story in a Valentine roulette and I thought I was done with them. Like I didn't set it up to go on so it was a little weird. So, and then they were also were like lived in two different cities. So I had like, they were, it was an ongoing BDSM relationship, like master slave in two different cities. And so it just was weird because I didn't have the meet cute and I didn't have the adhesion. So it made the, you know, it, it threw my beats off, um, which made it just a strange book to write. You know, and they already were like, they already liked each other, obviously, because they were in this relationship, but it was like, they had to solve the problem of being long distance and of whether it was more than master slave, like more than just like BDSM sex in a hotel or if it was gonna become something. Um, Cause they were just like meet, like doing like weekend sex. So, so that was kind of, so the, yeah, that was a different one for me to write, but they just kept talking to me. Like I thought I was done with them. I'm like, they had their little story, but then they just like, you know, these scenes kept showing up and I was like, okay, I'll tell your story then. And they were all, they were all like hot sex scenes too. I was like, this book is going to be like 90% sex. Like, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm sure a lot of your readers are not complaining about that. <laughs> they seem to be okay. I mean, some people were, some people didn't like the long distance. Like that was hard for them because I mean, it was hard. Like the whole thing took place in a hotel. I was like, I was like, God, I got to get them out of this hotel room. I got to get them out of bed. I got to look get their clothes back on and to do something like what should I do 
I love that. I'm so excited. I want to talk a little bit about your Facebook group. I recently came across it, uh, recommended through a friend, etc. Here we are. Um, I love your Facebook group. Uh, Facebook group. It's called uh, Abundance Mindset for Authors, and it's such good value. And it's for you know anyone who wants to. I want to say escalate their career, but also find inner peace with themselves and have a really, as it says, abundant mindset. So I'm curious as to why you decided to make this group, but also when did these things start coming into play for you? What sort of resistance and challenges did you have initially in your writing career? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm huge. Like I've always been woo woo. Like I said, I was a Reiki practitioner and, um, you know, so I've been on that like woo woo path forever. And then, you know, it was like, when I started really clearing my blocks was that year I went from, you know, I five X my income. And a lot of that was clearing out, you know, I'm sort of like a hippie granola, you know, environmentalist or whatever. And so clearing out that idea that like rich people are the opposite of that, or like that I can't be an environmentalist and have money or that I can't, um, you know, that I can't be an artist. Like I was like the starving artist or the, I was the PTA mom. Like I had all these like, self images that were small. And so to really like clear that out and be like, well, am I willing to be rich? Am I willing to say I want money? Am I willing to say I love money? Am I willing, like all those things that we have all these blocks to, like to say I love money, it was hard to say that. Like I had to clear blocks to be able to say that um, because that felt wrong. And so that, I think it was huge for me to like bust out and I'm still bust, like I still bust all the time. I have to bust them, you know, make myself small and then go, wait, why are you so small? Like you need to, like, we just make these little mental cages for ourselves that, um, and when I look at successful authors, I'm like, they take themselves seriously. And I was just like, not like, I was like, oh, I just write slutty, smutty, you know, sci-fi alien books, or I just... Like I had all these like places where I put myself down and thought like I wasn't as good as, you know, all those other people because of all these reasons. And so really like, it's about valuing yourself, like loving your books, thinking that you're, you're worth it. Your books are worth it. Like your readers are worth it. All of those things. What was the sort of, was there one particular pinnacle moment you had that it was you know, you're like, ah, finally, I feel that relief. I am worth this. Or was it just a lot of hard work to get to a place where you felt comfortable saying, you know what, I do deserve this. And my books are awesome. I think it was just a lot, like just knocking out because there's just like millions of those little thoughts that you have. So it's just like knocking them out one at a time. Yeah. I I mean, just in even like putting, learning to put myself I don't even know if I can say this yet, but I'm trying to put myself first instead of like, I was always the, you know, person who was trying to help everybody else. And so I guess I didn't, you know, I didn't think I was worth it. I didn't think my books were worth it. I didn't think, you know, all of those things. So it's like just busting through all of that, which doesn't mean to like get a fat head and be like, oh, my books are so great. But I think that if you, if you're not operating from like judgment about yourself or your books, then you can see what they need to make them better. Yeah. And you I know, think like, if you're putting your heart and soul into something, it makes sense to fully believe it. And um, this is why I absolutely love your Facebook group too, is because there's so many supportive authors who are in there who they're all after the same end goal. It's such a nice support system. You know, you can go into different Facebook groups, but it's probably been the most positive group I've been in before and it really does make the difference because you're like this is possible I can go for this I can aim for this what are some of the practices that you would say help you with knocking out those nonsense thoughts (laughs) and blockages yeah well and I agree like the I love that group so much because like someone will post a question and I'm usually late. I'm slow, like seeing things on Facebook and I'll look and like 20 people have already answered for like the most supportive, positive responses. Like I just freaking love it. So there are like, so there's so many ways to clear. And I think, you know, you have to find what works for you, but what I like to do is um, 
I like lately I've been into like the tools of access consciousness and they have like a clearing statement you can say. And it's basically, it's like shorthand for like pages and pages and pages of clearing that, that mean like clearing through like all levels, layers, dimensions, times, you know, so you just sort of like say this, but I don't, I also don't believe you have to like, it's not like a magic spell that you have to say these words. Like, I think that you can just like, your intention can be like, I'm clearing it through all time, space, dimensions, you know, like, but so like that to me was really useful. And also because like what they like in access consciousness, that's kind of what they do is like look for things to clear. So they kind of taught me the act of like going, Oh, that's a judgment I need to bust. You know, that's a, oh, that's a judgment again. That's a, you know, like that's a, another belief I have that's not true. It's a lie. Their um, tools sort of trained me to start looking for those things so I could clear them out. What has been your favorite book to write so far and why? You can only choose one. I think I always say it's like the last book I wrote. Like I don't, I don't, I couldn't pick one. I think it's, I'm always like enamored with the last thing I wrote usually. Often like the first book in each series seem maybe because it's like a new series. Like all of the firsts seem like favorites, I guess. Maybe it's also it's super exciting because you have that different world building happening as well. I think, yeah. Cause it's like this, this you're really birthing a whole new creation with them. I love that. Well, speaking then of world building, I want to talk a little bit about your partner in crime, Lisa Vino. So you guys co-write together, which is amazing. And he's doing an awesome job at it. How did you find co-writing initially? The first time you ever did it, how did you find the process? Because it's it's not for everyone and that's completely fine. Yeah. And it's often quite different. It's And I have three different co-writers and we do it. We all do it differently. But um with Lee, it started, I already had, so I had pitched this series, I had the Bad Boy Alpha series um, to an, or an, for an agent to pitch. Like I had, so I'd written, so I had like, I think maybe six chapters of the first book and three chapters of the second book and maybe just a synopsis of the third. And then I had like full synopses of, for, of one and two, but I had written them in third person past tense. And Lee was like, look, everybody's doing first person present tense now. Like, let's make these hip. So she like took the first six chapters that I had and like translated them into first person and like added, like, she's just funnier than I am. <laughs> so she adds in like, if, like, if you ever laugh, it's probably cause she wrote it, you know, it's like, she adds in like all these little jokes. And um, so then like, she was going through the six chapters I'd already written as I would like went forward with it. So that was like our first book. It was like a very weird, like rewriting. And then second book was similar because I already had some chapters of that too. And then after that we did where like one person would lead for the whole book and the other person would follow. So like, um, so we kind of like, if, and we kind of alternated, although then it, you know, she had babies and it got, you know, it's kind of changed up, but um, it'd be like, you know, she would take the lead and then I would go through and add all my stuff and fix. And then, I would take the lead and she would go through and add, you know, like not just an edit, like still like adding in and changing and stuff, but like, yeah, like one person kind of, it was their baby. Yeah. And then like when I write with Vanessa Vale, we really just like volley back and forth. And I love that because it makes it go really fast. Yeah. So it's like, like, I know. Chapter. Yeah. Like I'll, or yeah, just to tell you. So I'll be like, Oh, well, she's waiting for me to write this section. You know, like we, it's like, that's, yeah. So it's like, I know I need to do this today because she's going to look at it tomorrow. And then same thing, she does it the next day so that I can look at it. So it's like, it just makes it writing a book go really fast. I want to talk a little bit about your onstage presence because you're very active in the, in the community. You do a lot of guest speaking, you help a lot of authors and whether it's like podcast or online or, you know, uh, blog interviews, whatever it may be. So I was wondering what sort of, how you first got into guest speaking um, and what advice you might have to writers or authors who want to have a more on stage presence, but they don't know where to start. What, what advice would you offer? Um, I love that you see me that way because it's not in my self image yet, but I want it to be. Um, I guess I got started just my local RWA asked me to speak. And so, well, that's not true. I guess my publisher, I'd spoken before for like my publisher, like it did, like when they had a con like a just for other writers conference. Um, I put together some presentations for that. And then I did the like local RWA and um, and then the abundance mindset group came out of 
um, Sky Warren does the romance author mastermind, and she had invited me to do abundance mindset at a round table. And I was just tickled because it is literally my favorite topic. Like, like I say, like I'm woo woo. I've been into this forever. Like I could talk forever about it. Like it's just my favorite thing. And so I, cause I thought when I first opened the email, cause the year before I had done like a sci-fi table and I was like, Oh, well, and then I was like, abundance mindset. Oh my gosh. Yes. Like so excited. Um, and then it just seemed like people were into it. So it was fun to like start a face group, Facebook group so we could chat about it. Um, but I would love, like if I ever, I think I resisted quote unquote, like teaching or speaking before because I felt like this feels like my niche, the abundance mindset, because otherwise I feel like, I feel like no one's advice applies to you. You know what I mean? Like we each have our own path. And so I hate when people are up there going like, follow, do this and then it'll work because it's, that's not true necessarily. It might be like, you need to follow your own knowing. Like, does it feel like, did what they tell you feel light or did it feel heavy? Did it, you know, make you excited or make you scared? Like there's like so many factors is timing's different. Like if you follow what I did in 2012, it's probably not going to work. Like it's a different time. If it's the market's different, like there's just, there's so many factors. And so I, like, I hate when there's like the guru, I don't hate the gurus, but I hate the like idea that there's like a way to follow that it's going to get everybody to the same place because it doesn't work like that in my opinion so like to me this topic of just like trusting your knowing loving your books you know busting out your blocks changing your self-image like that is something that i feel like could take you anywhere wherever you want to go and so like that's like to talk about that just it lights me up you know so I'm so excited to see the next years to come because I absolutely have full faith and know that you're going to go like a mile with this. I'm so excited. And another okay. thing to mention too is that you have this information in your um, emails. Like I subscribed. And so you do give like awesome practical steps and um, references to personal um, obstacles that you had in the process, which is quite personal as well. So I love that. Yeah, I feel like we learn more from when people share their stories of their like, cause then you can, you remember like, oh, I remember Renee said like she melted down when she got that book bub and then this is what she did to get past it. And so then when you're melting down about something, you'll remember my meltdown and like clear it, right? Like, otherwise, like you just, it's otherwise sometimes you don't remember in the moment. Like, what do I do? I get, like when you get, when you're lost, you're lost, you know? Yeah. And I think too, like, it's really nice as well in the group. I'm um, so you can tell I'm such an advocate for the group. Um, but it's really nice too, because you can ask those, hey, has anyone gone through X, Y, Z? What was your experience with it? And you know that everyone that's in there is coming from a place of positivity and they want to see you grow. And I absolutely love that. And I found that since there's a couple of books, you know, that's been referred to and I've started reading them. And again, I, I thought I already had a positive mindset prior and I believe in the law of attraction and I do those practices. But I feel like it definitely has gone up a notch since reading about money blocks and things. I'm like, oh, yeah. And it's so ironic because now when I talk to author friends and they'll say something, now that I'm conscious of my own thoughts and what I'm putting out there, and then when they'll say something, I'm like, oh, maybe that's what's holding you back a bit. Like, you don't fully believe in your books. Like, this is this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm noticing. And I might have never noticed that before. So, And so slowly I'm like, read this book, do this, you'll love this. So, but it's, it's just so wonderful to have that community. It's important. I know because yeah, cause sometimes you don't see it for yourself. Like where you're sometimes, you know, it's that thing where like, it's easier to help someone else with their problem than your own. And so then when you're reading about like, anytime someone shares something, it might help a hundred other people, you know, it's just so useful. So let's, let's go big picture here. I love asking these questions. What would your ideal sort of presentation of being able to help other people make them more aware of the abundance mindset um, for writers? What would that look like for you? Would that be your own podcast? Would that be just guest speaking internationally? What does that look like for you? I love that question. I would love to do, yeah, podcasts and speaking, but I have in the works and you know it's just it's just like juggling time but I want to do like a workbook because you know we're all writers and I feel like free writing is like such a really amazing tool for like mining our un unconscious or subconscious um for the things for like it could be like for nuggets of like um inspiration like what your book needs to get out in the world or it could be something that needs to be blocked but like 
so the act, like I want it to be like a workbook where it's like has the prompts and then people free write the answers and then like hopefully have all the answers for the knowing for them, right? I want to talk a little bit about, most impressively, your books have also been translated in numerous different languages and audio books. So I was curious as to what the step-by-step process is for that and what you found most challenging initially until, you know, of course, it became second nature. Yeah. Yeah, I got in, I spent, I guess, over, I think it was like the last, not the last RAM, but the two RAMs ago, <laughs> where I left and I was like, okay, I've, I'm going to do translations, you know, like that, that's going to be it. And um, it was harder than I thought. I mean, it's just, it's so intimidating when you don't speak the language to like figure it out. And then, okay, but then this goes back to mindset, right? Because I brought that, I made myself small. I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't speak the language. And so my first project was very hard and I don't think it needed to be that hard. But I, again, like this is how like your, you know, your thoughts attract your reality, right? So I was like, oh my God, I'm going to screw this up. It's really hard. I got like drama you would not believe, but I had like one translator like telling me that the other one sucked. And then I got like another editor and it was like that project took, I had published like three other series before that very first series I started on ever got out because I had so much drama around it. It was ridiculous. (laughs) And that I think is because I brought my blocks to the table instead of clearing them, instead of being like, no, I'm, I am a smart young woman who can figure this shit out. Like I was like, oh God, it's so hard. I don't know what I'm doing. And so that's what I got was like, it's so hard. I don't know what I'm doing. I guess that's the going forward though with intent as well, because like, and I've done this in the past heaps of times, I have splashed cash. I'm like, well, maybe this will work or maybe this will work. I'm waiting basically for the pastor to stick on the wall. And now that I look black, look back and reflect on that, I'm like, of course it wasn't going to work because I didn't have the intent that it was working. I was just trying to say, well, I'm, I'm doing my best, but I wasn't, I was just being. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You just gave me goosebumps. Cause I think, so forever I struggled with that question of like KU or wide. Right. And you know, there's like people who make their camps and they are like, Nope, you got to do this. Right. And so, so I was like, well, I'm going to, like, I was doing really well in KU, but I was like, I'm going to try you know, try, first of all, I, we know what try means, right? Like that means you're not being a clear intent. Like that's just like throwing the pasta on the wall. So I'm like, I'm going to try this one series and see how it does. And so I did, and it was very like, eh, I mean, it wasn't bad. It wasn't good. You know, it was like, I think KU was maybe a little more, but not, you know, it was very inconclusive. And then I realized it really is just, like you said, it's a matter of setting your intent. Like if I had gone in and being like, why does going to work for me? It would have, but I was kind of like, I'm trying wide. We're just going to see. And then same thing with KU. If you're in KU being like, I don't know about KU. Is this the wrong thing? Like then it might be the wrong thing because you're not, that's the, you're putting out the, is this the wrong thing? (laughs) Right. The energy that you're putting out. So I ended, I did end up, I am mostly wide now. And it was because when I started co-writing with Vanessa Vale, she's wide and she already had the energy of like wide works. Let, Let me show you. And I was like, you're right, it works. So then I was really like, then when I went wide, I was already like, yeah, it works. I know it works. Like, but I, but the first time when I dabbled, like the pasta on the wall, it was, you know, I was just like wishy-washy about it. It wasn't like, I am going to be a millionaire author by going wide. I was just like, I don't know, I'm going to see if this works. Like, so yeah, I think intent is everything. Yeah. And it's so true. And I think one thing too, I want to make a point of as well is, um, understand that it, not contradicting what you said but I'm like on an upset I'm just thinking of previous experiences I'm like not everything works out but it's usually for a reason and I am a firm believer and I'm like oh, everything happens for a reason and although you had all your eggs in one basket and if it doesn't go where you thought it would go I can guarantee you in six to 12 months something else has happened and you'll go that's why it didn't work because if that went forward then it would have blocked me off from being able to have this more lavish whatever totally i got goosebumps totally (laughs) absolutely yeah it's like don't don't uh don't lose faith (laughs) right absolutely and how how did you find with uh the audiobooks so audio i've just been mostly doing actually i'm about to do my first wide so we'll see but i was just doing acx you know self-pub 
just that was the easy button. You know, just they make it so easy. So a, I just kept hitting the easy button on that. How did you go choosing your um, narrator? How did I? Um, I don't I feel like I got so lucky. I just I think I just put him up for audition. Um, and I just got great narrators. I think nowadays, like, you know, because things are different, but you might want to look for like the one like because there are narrators who bring their own following. Like where people are like, oh, he's narrated it. I'm buying, you know. So like nowadays you might want to look for like the it people. But um, but I'm so like the guy who's doing he, he did um, Vegas Underground and then he's doing um, Chicago Bratva. Like I was like, I don't know if you can do a Russian accent. I've got this Russian guy. He's like, I see Russian. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, what are the chances? Like, he's amazing. He does all these accents. and like, he's amazing. That's awesome. How do you... Um... On a marketing side of it, how do you market audiobooks? Is it a little bit different to how you market your books or is it same, same? No, and again, like it's, it changes. So for a while there, um, I made a killing because they would pay you for the, um, if you were exclusive, ACX would pay you for the reviewers. And so it, the idea was just to get all those review copies out and you'd make bank just on, you know, that would cover like the whole narrator cost just on your review copies. And it would trigger the algorithm. Like if you get all your reviewers to download it in the first few days, then it's telling Audible, show this book, it's really popular. And it would trigger that algorithm. So I do still use that method of, even though I don't get paid anymore for the reviews, I do still try to give out the codes right away because of the uh, downloads and it looks, then it pushes the algorithm. And that's pretty much my own only strategy other than I don't yet, I know there's a lot of people who really have their, a great audio game and they release at the same time. And I am just not a really great planner that way. I would love someday, maybe that'll happen, but. But it is still like a lot to keep up with, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep up with publishing one book with an ebook and a paperback, let alone all the other options involved as well. Well, and then, and then you have to hold it back, right? Cause like, so you write it and then you give it to them. It's another th three months or whatever. And I'm like, oh, or I could just publish it and start making money on it now. So I'm just too impatient. I think I'm just a very impatient person, you know, like I just don't have the patience to wait. Although I'm sure you could do like a kick-ass launch if you did, you know, you waited three months and you had your ducks in a row and you had the audio and all that. But what advice would you have? So all of your books are a little bit something smexy and kinky and all of the, all of the in-betweens. What writing advice would you offer to those who are wanting to write with the element of romance in it? What do you think are things that need to remain consecutive for it to seem realistic? That is an excellent question. Um, I feel like it's that, the deepening, like where you go, like where you go deeper, 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 really trying to get into your characters. Um, and that's when you know, cause then when you go to write something like, let's say you wanted it to go one way, but then like you're, you're so in that character that you're like, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> Even though you wanted them to, like your plot in your head was gonna have them do this thing, but it's like, no, it's not true to that character. Like you're, you just know them so well that, and the times I feel like the times I have trouble is when I'm not deep enough into the character, you know, where I'm, and that's when I'm re like really start struggling with like, where am I going with this? I don't know what's happening, you know, like, yeah when you like just really, you know, when you just start to like sit in the character all day and you're like, know what they would have for breakfast and what they would do in this situation or that situation. And even if those don't go in the book, it's like you getting to know them better. And I think that's like such an important note too, because I know I've read uh, many of, of books and you know, you get about halfway through and then they do something and it's immediately turned me off as a reader because I've gone, that person wouldn't do that because you've already created a, a profile for them. And if it doesn't fit with, unless of course, you know, they're a crazy or psychotic kind of character who sometimes anything goes, but the actions always has to be justified. And I've always found that either the pace isn't matching with what's, you know, what's happened. I'm just like, there was no in between here. This shouldn't have happened. Or it's just, it's just not in there, in their patterns. It's not in their behavior. So you can't, you can't change their behavior all of a sudden to fit, to fit it you know the story has to fit them totally and I think too it's sort of um 
because we write full time and because we are looking out for the, our own inconsistencies to make sure it can be the best when we do watch a movie or read another book I'm just like mm -mm, that's inconsistent and then I feel so terrible in thinking that but I'm like but I do this process with my own work so you really start spotting the difference yeah I feel like if, I feel like watching this year of Netflix you know the COVID year of Netflix like we're learning craft and we're seeing when like it's to me it's like an important skill to be able to watch and go and realize why it fell short. Like when you watch, because some of them are so brilliant and some of them are not. And then like now I can start to say like why one was so good and one, even though they had like the same basic plot, you know, like all those Christmas romances, right? That they put on and they all have this sort of the same basic plot and some like you can really hang on to. And the ones that don't, I think, again, it's like they're not deep enough. Like it's too, you know, they didn't, they're the, characters aren't quirky enough there's not enough like to keep it from being the like just brushstroke yeah you know so but true. I mean there's other reasons why they fail too but like I feel like that's we're honing craft by just noting those things you know what would you say your three top marketing tips are for fellow authors I mean I go back to the woo-woo of like love your books is my number one because when you're out of judgment when you're out of like oh god I, I don't know I hope it's good enough. I hope when you're in that space, like you're not going to put it out in the world with the right energy. And when you're in the space of like this freaking awesome book, and I'm going to do everything possible to get it into the right hands, then you're going to like the magic will start happening. Like the quantum entanglements, like someone will be like, Hey, do you want to be in my newsletter? And you'll be like, why? Yes, I would. Or like, you'll get invited to the party or like whatever it is, like that stuff, just you'll get the, you know, where Kindle wants to do a special on you or like those things will just start happening for you because you had the right energy behind your book. But, you know, otherwise, like, I guess I would say the same basic, like, you know, Facebook ad, BookBub, you know, the same advice. Those things definitely work for sure. One thing I absolutely, I love all of those. And your first one, I love the most um, because I think it's important too. And this is the reason why I'm doing this channel is do not compare and I know we always say it it's a story as old as time but don't compare yourself to an author who's been in this for 5 10 20 years they're at a different level to you simply because they've got all those years of experiences of stumbling of falling of building and that's why I love doing these interviews is to show everyone who's just started or a couple of years in this can be you in four years it doesn't mean to say like they're there it's very rare that there's overnight successes so I think that's why it's important to love your books don't discredit their power or how amazing they are just because you think somebody else is further because they've been doing it for more years as it should be absolutely what's been your greatest challenge and your greatest accomplishment of your career so far I had a tough time writing through the year I got divorced which was last year year before year before last um I did keep writing and I didn't my income didn't go down it obviously it didn't go up and up tiny tiny bit but but it was a little hard like being like I'm a failure at a ro at my own romance but I'm writing romance like you have a, some of that like what the hell am I doing <laughs> thoughts um and also just like life is so chaotic going through it like you're dealing with so much anyway um you know, a move, handling your kids' emotions, your own emotions, like just all the change. And so I think that was challenging for me. Um, I think expectation can be a bitch. Like, you know, you have a success and then you think your next book is going to be as successful. You know, anytime you start like predicting things, it sets you up for failure. Like you you lose the openness of like, what does the universe want to give me? And you go into like, oh, conclusion, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And then it's always disappointing, I think. Like, well, I, for, I think there was a second half of your question that I forgot. What, what has been your greatest accomplishment? I still feel like, oh, it's yet to be determined. <laughs> like, <Amazing. laughs> um, right, okay, I mean, it's been so far. Yeah, hitting seven figures, that because forever I was like, I want to be a millionaire author. Like, that was my target. And so hitting it w w felt like a really big accomplishment. How did you celebrate? I ordered a cake. Um, I'm gluten-free, so there's like this really delicious gluten-free cake. And then I had champagne and, or maybe just wine. And um, I played the Celebrate song. So I was like ready, like I was watching my, um, my KDP, what do you call it? No, my book report. 
and I was, we were at like nine ninety nine, nine, you know, like that day. And I was like, it's going to happen today. And so I ordered the cake and then we were ready and I had the wine. And then we just sat and watched it for like the last 10 minutes until it rolled over. Into the <laughs> Me and my kids. And then we danced. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Best fun. cake ever, right? Totally. Yeah. So then when, like now my kids always want to like, I hit the USA Today list a couple weeks ago and Owen's like, we need a cake, you know, like you better order a cake. I was like, I don't know if we, we don't have to get a cake every time. <laughs> That's awesome. How do the younger ones feel about mum being a superstar author? They are so unimpressed. Are you so, yeah. I, I was reading, I was laughing because um, I was reading, or I think it was um, Obama was talking about his book. And he said the same thing about his daughters. Like they just could, they like, yes, he was the president of the United States and they are just like, so not impressed with him. You know? <laughs> yeah, they don't want to, they don't want to read my books. They don't care about my books. Like they don't, they're just like, yeah, whatever, mom. Like, <laughs> We'll give them a couple of years. We'll give them a few years to appreciate, you know, quality. We'll give them a few years. We'll, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> what has been your most memorable reader moment? I had a reader, I was so in love with this. Um, I have a reader who came to see me at a show. Okay, so my sci-fi series is set on this planet where they have these crystals. And so she shows up at the show and on her backpack, she's like, this is my Zandian crystal. Like she had, I was like, I can't believe it. Like she was so in my world that she wanted to carry a little crystal. It made me so happy. It was just like the best ever. She's she's amazing. This is my favorite, favorite question to ask. What is the goal for you? What is the dream that you're chasing? Well, it's always the next thing, right? So now I'm like, I want a Netflix or I want, you know, like I want, I want to be on film, the TV, whatever, you know, like screen. Yes. What, what series are we thinking is going to, when it hits? I mean, that's where I'm like, I, I have way more blocks to bust out before this can happen. Because when you ask me that, I'm like, well, none of them are good enough. <laughs> so, I, it's, do, you, do you have an agent? Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I'm going to send them a strongly worded email that they need to work a little bit. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I um it's kind of ironic actually that you mentioned that I have given this example a few times is that um in 2018 one of my books just released the Shadow Minds Journal anyway it was in uh Frankfurt Book Expo um be displayed got picked up by a um film company that had just you know come out and I googled them and it turns out that the CEO who just like opened it used to be the president of Warner Brothers and as soon as I saw that I was like oh my gosh I'm not ready this isn't happening and I psyched myself out completely and of course it didn't go anywhere but it's a huge example and I learned a lesson then I was like oh okay I've prevented that from happening because I said this can't happen now I'm not ready and so I think that's like you're absolutely like bang on saying you need to be you need to be ready for it so I think that's really important and I cannot wait until your Netflix show comes out because it's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you yeah so I really I still have to like bust through all the things that tell me I'm not not good enough yet not ready yeah like there's still I haven't written the series yet that's going to be there like I have all these stories that are which may or may not be true but like clearly it's going to keep it from happening until there's something I do believe so and that's the thing too is if we haven't experienced it before we don't know what to expect we're unfamiliar with it and that's scary so right. what are the things that you, what are your daily practices that you always will do most days to sort of try and make sure you're staying positive. So the, my, I had a word for 2021, which was joy. And so I've been trying to ask, if I just ask the question in the morning, how much joy wants to come out and play today? And just having that question usually changes. Cause usually I'm like how much work I have to do today. You know, like I'm very, like, I work too hard, you know, like I have some workaholism issues. So asking the question, like how much joy wants to come out and play or, you know, what would bring me joy? Like I was just journaling on it this morning and I saw riding my bike, which is not something I ever do. I was like, really? Like, I didn't know I wanted to ride my bike. So I just thought that was so interesting. And that's why I'm really a big proponent of like the journaling with questions, you know, cause you've, you discover things that you didn't realize, you know? 
I have a segment called Speed Dating with an Author. So you and I are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I'm just so sweet that way. And basically what it is is just five rapid questions. Are you ready? I am ready. Amazing. What is the most clumsiest moment you've ever had? <laughs> um, dancing, I once, we were performing in a mall and I fell into the fountain. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Tap dancing into the fountain. It was very slick. The taps on the tile in the mall, very slick. Like we could not stay on our feet. It was crazy. <laughs> That's amazing though. That's something you would see in a rom-com. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Did you keep uh, I was, you I was little. Fortunately, I was not an adult at the time, but you know. Did you keep dancing when you got up or was that game over for you? I think I did. I wasn't soaked. It was just like sort of like a skidding in, you know, and yeah. But then we just laughed and laughed a lot. Like, I mean, it was like giggle girls for like hours about it. Well, the show must go on, right? <laughs> just... Def I'm a huge proponent. Like the show goes on. What are the three words that would best describe you? That's funny. I just got, I heard joyful. So it must be working. Um, understanding. Like I, ha I think I'm pretty intuitive. Like I am empathic and um, loving. I love those. Those are awesome. Those are good qualities. <laughs> what is the song that would best describe you? Be some, it'd be some 80s thing that I could dance to the kitchen, you know, like um, Manic Monday or or um, Dance Like an Egyptian or something. Okay. I'll look, those are both good songs, so I'll go with those. What is your life motto? Life. My life motto is follow your bliss. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. You're such like a... You're such a ball of like good energy. I love it. Um, what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not many people know about? You have a lot, so <laughs> yeah. I think it's the the Feldenkrais. I mean, not only like do not people not know that I do it, but then they don't know what it is. Um, but it really is. It's this amazing somatic body practice that can bring relief for like all kinds of pain, postural stuff. So. Where, where do we find you? What's coming up? Uh, where do we stalk you? Well, if you're an author, I would just absolutely love if you would join the Abundance Mindset for Author Facebook group. Um, I am on Facebook. I, I don't know if this was a mistake or not, but I have an English page, an Italian page, a French page, and a German page. So just depending on what language you speak, you could find me on Facebook. And um, try and TikTok, but I, I am not there yet. I'm trying, not really figured it out yet, but that's probably not the good place to find me, but you know, I'm trying. When did you recently start? So we're starting to build our TikTok platform. Awesome. I've only recently got into this. So I'm like, get it, you can do it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel so inhibited. Like that, uh, there's a, something I need to definitely blocks to clear on that where I'm just like, I'm too old and stupid for this. Like, <laughs> like I don't know what I'm doing. My, you realize I need to release this block is because I look at like, is this like funny or do I, is it my funny? Like, am I the only one that finds this funny? Because I think I'm a hilarious person. So I'm just like, but it's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, if you think it's funny, it'll be funny. That's my thing is I'm just like, I'm not funny and everything on there is funny. So I'm like, what do I do? I'm just not funny. You should do um, short snippets I've seen on there, inspirational ones. Like, um, that's, I think that might be my jam. Yeah. So you go I think that's what I'll do. Whoa, I think that'd be awesome. I'll follow. I'm going to follow straight after this. All right, cool. Amazing. Um, and of course, everything else we can find on your website, I believe. That's quite thorough as well with all the links and, uh, and a list of all your books. And you yes. are wide, so you're available on all retailers, I believe. Yes. That's exciting. Um, cool. We're going to check it out and I'll pop the links down below. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute blast. All right. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. And I will talk to you soon. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Bye.